so it's a, it's a really, really huge honor for me to introduce Erin Ballou tonight. Um, she's the executive, um, she's the artistic director, executive director is right there. Um, she's the artistic director of the Port Townsend Writers Conference. Um, and the, one of her books, I won't tell you which one, but one of the three books that she wrote actually changed my life and led to me taking the job at Centrum. Um, it, which kind of indirectly led to us asking her to, to be our artistic director. So again, it's just personally for me a huge honor to be able to introduce who I think is not only the best poet in the nation, but also sort of the coolest poet um, and just a terrific reader. Um, and I'm not going to say much more. Um, she, she's the author of three books, um, 1995's Infanta, um, 2000's One Above and One Below, and then 2005's um, Black Box, all of which are available um, through Copper Canyon Press. Um, without further ado, please welcome Aaron Ballou. I didn't know that. That made me blush. Thank you, Jordan. That's really kind. Um, and thank you all for being here. I, I really think of Port Townsend as kind of a, a home away from home. And, uh, and I really am thrilled that I have the opportunity to be a part of the Centrum community in this way and to work with the, the Writers' Conference because it's something that's really close to my heart. And you probably already know it, but you, you live in a really beautiful place full of a lot of really beautiful people, and I'm really happy to be here. Um, I was trying to think about how to organize the reading tonight, and I've been working with all these really smart, interesting poets in this little mini-intensive workshop that we're doing. So some of the poems I'm going to read tonight kind of respond to things that we've been talking about in our class, which is a fabulous class. Um, and and I'll, I'll talk about that as I go along. Um, did I say thank you to Northwind Art Center for uh, hosting this and, and for your graciousness and having me here? I really appreciate it. <clears throat> so we, had, we were talking about a poem today um, where poems that tell you to do something. And I've always, because I'm basically a bossy boots at heart, I, I have a number of poems that I've written in this form called a Georgic. And it's not so much a form as a kind of attitude in a poem, where it's a poem of instruction that comes out of uh, the, the classical Roman poetry, um, where you would, like, if you want to bring the bees to uh, the hive, you have to, like, beat a, a bull to death with a hawthorn branch and, I don't know, all kinds of weird Roman stuff. Um, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh God, it's a video. <laughs> okay, I love being video taped. Um, so this is a poem that's based on this idea of the Georgic, and it's called Georgic on Memory. So it's just a poem instructing you how to do something. Oops, I just realized I can't read with my glasses on. Can you guys hear it? All right. What, should, should I eat the mic? Eat the mic. Is that better? Okay. Let's see if I can figure out how to do this. Georgic on memory. Make your daily monument the ego. Use a masochist epistemology of shame and dog-eared certainty that others less exacting might forgo. If memory is an elephant, then feed the animal. Resist revision, the stand of feral raspberry, contraband fruit the crows stole, ferrying seed for miles. No, it was a broken hedge, not beautiful. Sunlight tacking its leafy gut in loose sutures. Lacking imagination, you'll take the pledge to remember. Not the sexy new idea of history. Each moment swamped in legend, liable to judgment and erosion. Still an appealing view to draft our lives. A series of vignettes where endings could be substituted. Your father, unconvoluted by desire, not grown bonsai in regret, the bedroom of blue flowers left intact. The room was nearly dark, the street light, a sentinel at the white curtain, its night face implicated. Do not retract this. Something did happen. You recall, can feel a stumbling over wet ground, the cave, the needle branches made around your body, the creature you couldn't console. And we, um, one of our friends in the workshop today brought in a, <clears throat> a Boston poem. Who was that? Was it Nancy or? Who brought in that great Boston poem today? 
Anyway, it's a really great Boston poem. I lived in Boston for years, and it sort of reminded me of this book. Uh, my first book, Infante, has a lot of Boston landscapes because that's where I lived for years. And this is a poem um, called Part of the Effect of the Public Scene is to Importune the Passing Viewer. For example, walking past the Ritz, a girl may be sitting on the last step crying as if alone, and you notice, even in this cocktail hour light, the little rips and shreds of her chapped lips and that she has no Kleenex and no one stops to offer one and you feel damned if you do or don't, not wanting to intrude as a man is standing maybe only three feet away. His profile approximating a little shame, some discomfort, but mostly a sphinx-like composure or boredom, perhaps, indicating they are together, together in that way you're not completely sure you'll ever want to know about again, and you're ashamed too, with nothing to offer but to gaze intently at the fascinating street lamp as you walk by. Probably you've caused a scene yourself, public or private, at a bar or in a strange apartment, when suddenly you became conscious of the drama, of the real pleasure in your tears, the catharsis of the wail and rage, the screams, the trashing of the joint, because that's what's next. Snipping up his Liberty of London ties, ripping off her nightgown, pushing her out naked on the patio for the neighbor's judgment, who are there to be sure, either by accident or rubberneck design, keeping score or scared for their own property. Or instead, you've been the impetus, unfaithful, deceitful, maybe only the hapless object of some other person's desire, thinking that for all their protestations of love, you might as well be a bathroom fixture or bookend. In either case, it's hard to make a graceful exit, as all scenes peter out in awkward ways. Someone's left thinking of the perfect remark, a remark that'll sink like an axe blade, the kind that are never on hand when needed, so that you end up shouting, spluttering, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> like a moron, like a damn fool, crying on the last step in front of strangers without a Kleenex. <laughs> no, I don't want to read that one. You know, I, as a matter of course, and I hope other people haven't heard me do this too much, but there's a poem that I always read because it got me banned in Boston, as a matter of fact. Like Jim Morrison, which is, I'm glad to be in that company. Um, I was invited to do, and this is what you get when you agree to read at Barnes & Noble. But, um, I can't yeah, know, it was terrible. And uh, I, was, I was invited to read at Barnes & Noble, and the day before the reading, I, I got a call from this poor assistant manager person who'd been stuck with the job of quizzing me about what I intended to read. And, and I hadn't really thought about it yet. And I was like, I, I couldn't figure out what she was getting at. But finally, she sort of confessed that one of the corporate managers had come in from Houston and seen that they were uh, advertising my reading and picked up my book that was on display. Apparently, he didn't read the poem, but he flipped through the table of contents and he saw this poem called Erections, which, I mean, could have been about buildings, right? But he... Um, but he just put the kibosh on it. He said that he needed, she needed to call up and tell me that I was not allowed to read erections at the reading. And I, I, I was like, why? Why can't it? What, what's his problem? And she said, well, he's afraid it will offend the many blue collar workers and children that frequent the establishment. <laughs> and I was like, how did blue collar workers and children get on the same continuum? And you know, whatever. So I make a point of reading this filthy, filthy poem whenever I read. And it's called Erections. When first described imperfectly by my shy mother, I tried to leap from the moving car. A response, I suspect, of not just terror, although a kind of terror continues to play its part, but also a mimetic gesture, the expression equal to a body system of absurd jokes and dirty stories. With cockeyed breasts peculiar as distant cousins and already the butt of the body's frat boy humor, I'd begun to pack a bag, would set off soon for my separate country. Now sometimes I admire the surprised engineering, how a man's body can rise, squaring off with the weight of gravity, single-minded, exposed as the blind in traffic. It's the body leaping that I praise, vulnerable in empty space. It's mapping the empty space, a man's life driving down a foreign road. And you can hear the homage to Stephen Dunn, those of you who are in the class. 
Say, that's not that dirty. I feel like I'm disappointed. <laughs> I just thought, you know, that I'm a little, I have to admit I'm a little bit nervous tonight because <clears throat> the thing I've actually been working on pretty nonstop for the last six months is a, a, a memoir about my experience as a parent. And I've never read it out loud before. And I thought if there's a little bit time at the end, I might read like just a scene or two. You know that feeling where you need to try something out just so it feels real to you? And I, give, I always feel like this is a safe space. So if you'll indulge me at the end, I'm going to just read a very short, very short prose section. But it's sort of breathing at me. I can see it every time I go to pick up a book. We'll put it over there. <laughs> prose, man. It's crazy prose writers. Um, this is a this is a poem called Plain Song. Um, for, and we've been talking a lot in the workshop about how difficult some material can be, even though we're incredibly attracted to it. There are just certain subjects that that drag us into you know difficulties in terms of craft, right? Because they drag you toward cliche, or it's hard to say something new about it. So for years, I had wanted to write a poem for my grandfather. And there's nothing that inexorably pulls you toward the cliche, like, you know, the poem for your grandfather. But it's one a lot of us, or for the grandparent, a lot of us want to write. Um, so finally, after years and years of carrying this around, I finally felt like I, I came up with a poem that was worthy of him. But one of the things that you should know in the poem is that uh, I grew up in Nebraska, and um, my grandfather spent the first, I guess, 10 years of his life living in a sod house. Um, and I have a picture, some itinerant photographer came along in 1912 or whatever and actually took a picture of my grandfather and his you know, 14 siblings sitting on top of this odd house. But the thing that I always find interesting about the picture, which is kind of hard to see, you have to look very closely, is that because there were so many children, apparently my great-grandmother would just put all of the clothing, the clean clothing, in kind of a, a chest. And if you were a lollygagger or layabout and were the last person to get to the box, you basically had to wear what was in there. Um, and in the picture, <laughs> I swear to God, this is true. In the picture, my grandfather is about nine years old wearing a pinafore. Um, so sort of cross-dressed, sitting on top of the sod house, sort of trying to hide himself in the back because he's wearing a dress. That doesn't actually come to the poem, but I can show you the photograph if you'd ever like to see it. So this is a poem for him called Plain Song. He lived in a sod house a formal nest of grass that wove green thread around his soul, a bed of mud and cellulose. And she was small. She never grew. The empty wind that blew and reared had bent her to the plains she cared so little for. But he, he didn't seem to mind her size. He'd found a shape to love there. And she was spare, where he was generous as sand, the kind of man who drifted like the yellow hills that lifted their sloping shoulders to the badlands. For her, his mud heart tumbled like the tufted weeds that wheel along the plains, that sea of mammoth bones, that state all made of sky. They married in July. Her thin bouquet of cornflowers remains the brightest thing he'd ever see. I have her ring now, a silver band so little it won't budge over the knuckle on my pinky. How long ago a man gave his grass soul to her in her brown dress, and she was always stern, too small, and learned to keep inside a sod house. Um, I had a very special request from the gentleman hosting this this evening to read a poem called <clears throat> I Heart Your Dog's Head which is my all-time favorite bumper sticker. Do you do this with your own poems where you carry around a title? And I just carried around, where my neighborhood, in my neighborhood in Cambridge, there was a car that always parked across from my apartment building. And you know, you see those, those bumper stickers that say I, and then they have the icon heart, and then it'll have a picture of like a Sheltie right there. But this guy just had a bumper sticker that was written out in cursive that said, I heart your dog's head. Um, which, man. Such a good bumper sticker. Um, and so I carried this, this bumper sticker around waiting for the opportunity to use it. Um, and it also has to do with my, um, the, my traumatic uh, experience of football as a child growing up in the state of Nebraska, where you either join the cult 
or you're driven out of the state, is, or basically your two choices. When I was a kid, if you went to try to escape Cornhusker football, people had kindly opened their windows and put radios in the window so that even if you went outside, there was no possible way you could miss the game. It was like that. So now I teach at Florida State. That really helps, right? <laughs> but, um, but this is actually about professional football. Do you all know who Bill Parcells is? Yeah. yeah. So I have a special loathing for him that becomes <laughs> apparent in this poem. I call him out in this poem. I have not heard from him because he is scared of me. <laughs> Clearly. So this is a poem called I Heart Your Dog's Head. I'm watching football, which is odd, as I hate football in a hyperbolic and clinically revealing way. But I hate Bill Parcells more because he is the illuminated manuscript of cruel, successful men, those with the slitty eyes of ancient reptiles who wear their smugness like a tight white turtleneck and revel in their lack of empathy for any living thing. So I'm watching football staying up late to watch football, hoping to witness, as I think of it, the humiliation of the tuna, as he is called, which is rightly Parcell's first time back in the Meadowlands since taking up with the Cowboys, who are, as we all know, thugs, even by the NFL standards. The reasons I hate football are clear and complicated, and were born as I was in Nebraska, where football is to life what sleep deprivation is to Amnesty International. <laughs> that is the best researched and most effective method of breaking a soul. Yes, there's the glorification of violence, the weird nexus knitting the homo, both phobic and erotic, but also and worse, my parents in 1971 drunk as Australian parrots in a bottle bush, screeching, we're number one, we're number one, when the Huskers finally clinched the Orange Bowl the two of them bouncing up and down crazily on the couch, their index fingers jutting holes through the ubiquitous trail of smoke rings that was the weather in our house, until the whole deranged mess that was them, my parents, the couch, their lit cigarettes, flipped over backward onto my brother and me. <laughs> my husband thinks that's a funny story, and in an effort to be a good sport, I say I think it is too. Which leads me to recall the three chihuahuas who've spent the fullness of their agitated lives penned in the back of my neighbor's yard. Today they barked continuously for 12 minutes. I timed it as the UPS guy made his daily round. They bark so piercingly. They tremble with such exquisite outrage that I've begun to root for them, though it's fashionable to hate them. And increasingly dark threats against their tiny persons move between the houses on our block. But isn't that what's wrong with this version of America? The jittering, small-skulled, inbred by no choice of their own are despised? And Bill Parcells, the truth is, he'll win this game. I know it, and you know it. And sadly, did it ever seem there was another possible outcome? It's a small deposit, but I'm putting my faith in reincarnation. I need to believe in the sweetness of one righteous image and Bill Parcells trapped in the body of a teacup poodle as any despised thing forced to yap away his next life staked to a clothesline pole or doing hard time on a rich old matron's lap, <laughs> dyed lilac to match her outfit. I want to live there someday, across that street, and listen to him yap, yap, yap. <laughs> Um, I can't see you. I've got to get my eyeballs fixed. Um, this is a poem I, that I like to read because it reminds me of Tallahassee when I'm feeling homesick. You can feel homesick for Tallahassee, believe it or not. Um, one of the interesting things about Tallahassee is that there are lots of guns there, and people like to shoot them. And so I was sort of interested in that and have gone out to the shooting range um, a number of times. With a, with a dastardly ex-boyfriend. I don't know how many women here have ever had a relationship with a like full-on Savannah, old trust fund, money, Republican, mm -hmm. alcoholic, Southern man. Does anybody else? <laughs> Raise your hand. Like, after I got divorced, I thought that was a good idea, you know? <laughs> alcoholic, narcoleptic, Republican, trust fund, 
Savannah, like seven generations, and all of their names are Lee, right? <laughs> and they, they, have, oh, they non-ironically have Confederate flags. It, it seemed like a good idea at the time. So this is about going shooting with that particular particular man. Oh, but they're charming as the day is long. I mean, they can just get the birds right out of the trees onto their backs. So be very, caref- be very careful if you go down Georgia Way. <laughs> so this is a poem called Shooting Range. Aren't you just like the daddy every girl dreams of, with your handgun cocked and your pant- pants pockets full of dirty peppermints? You taught me to aim at nothing but a bullet likes to bury itself, and we're all equally worthy. This ridge of drought-colored trees, concrete backstop pocked with ammo, redneck in a camo bikini fondling her boyfriend's Glock, everything thrilled to surrender, asking the same question we've always had in common. Who's the better killer? You've had more practice, but I'm a natural. So step a little to the left, and I'll do you a favor. Then you do me. Wasn't that the deal? This day is so blue, so pretty, let's smash it under glass. A last weepy moment you'll remember someday, living in your future, another hitman gone to wind and belly, selling your glory hold stories to a new ingenue on the final installment plan. <clears throat> oh, that's not even the most pissed off poem in the book. <laughs> There's nothing like heartbreak to get your work going. So, in a, so uh, okay. I'm going to go ahead and try this, and I'm going to watch your response, and if I start hearing butt wiggling and the dry, wandering cough, I'll stop, but I'm just going to do a little bit. (laughs) Oh, it's Michael. Yay. I'm so glad you're here. Okay. So I'm trying to think. I've never read prose before, so this is a a big deal for me. the only thing you need to know is that when my, I have a 10 year old son whose name is Jude, and this is a, the working title for this manuscript is called The Boy with Two Voices. And when Jude was born, he was strangled by the birth cord, which left him with an injury that basically um, sort of paralyzed the nerves around his vocal cords and affected his lips and tongue. And so he's almost completely typical. He's quite the rapscallion and an evil genius. But he has uh, he, he doesn't have much of a voice. It's very difficult for him to speak and be understood. And so when I was thinking about what I wanted to do next, I was I was really interested in. So there's that, and I was also interested in the fact that when I had my son, there seemed to be kind of a dearth, or at least I couldn't find any books about being a mom that seemed very real to me. They all seemed sort of chirpy, and everybody was just full of love, and you know, babies like slept through the night immediately, and it, it was just kind of anxiety-producing because I just didn't find anything where I felt there were people who were having a... Maybe I just don't didn't know they were out there, but I, I just couldn't find books where the complication of loving these little creatures was truthfully and sort of honestly put out there. Um, and so one of the things I was thinking, uh, and especially if you're trying to parent a child who sort of lives outside the boxes in certain ways, so this is what I've been really interested in doing for you know the last six months or so, and so I thought I'd try some of it on you. Okay? Um, the first chapter is called Jude the Obscure. <clears throat> Fetal Distress. Not a phrase you find in the pregnancy books we first-time parents read like nervous tourists clinging to our travel guides, the custom line moving too quickly toward the mouth of a foreign country, the babies in fetal distress. Lying in a hospital bed and ready to push three hours into one of the fastest first-child labors any of the nurses at Ohio's Lancaster Medical have ever witnessed, I hear my preternaturally calm doctor speak these words to Jay, my husband. I focus on the doctor's face and see the inchworm of anxiety that's crawled between her eyebrows. With this, the quiet room begins to buzz, nurses moving quickly now, pachydermic in their baggy surgical grays, bringing in the sleek, beeping equipment that seems to attend anything having to do with the body. I haven't slept for three days before this, so swollen and uncomfortable that I finally beached myself on the living room couch with an elaborate system of pillows. I watch the weak winter sun going up and down, occupying my exhaustion with movie after movie Jay brings to me. Finally, the night before, I'd been summoned to the hospital. Our baby is now 10 days past his due date. It's January 10th, 2001, and the part of southern Ohio where we live is shrink-wrapped in a veil of ice. 
At this point, I'm a dead ringer for the Venus of Willendorf, my fecundity alarming and of ridiculous proportions. They warn me, if this baby doesn't get a show on the road, steps will be taken. But I am a coward. Much of the last nine months in my mind have been devoted to secretly obsessing over the pain and humiliation my body is heading for, my terror of embarrassing myself at the hospital, the awful stories I've heard of women doing unspeakable things during labor. I can't force my mind around the idea of strangers seeing me abject and helpless. My childhood fear of needles comes roaring back, not just a fear, a flat-out phobia. I'm obsessed with getting the doctor to agree that I needn't have the IV all pregnant women receive as a precaution in the hospital. I harass her on every point of my birth plan, negotiating each detail of my labor until her office staff must make a superhuman effort not to roll their eyes when I come in for my checkups. My chart has definitely been flagged. (laughs) Being summoned to the hospital means they'll put me on an IV Pitocin drip a magical potion they use to coax tardy wombs into flying open, except when it doesn't work, causing the contractions to become more intense and unmanageable, and often resulting in a C-section due to failure to progress. The womb stays jammed shut like a fire exit in an old auditorium, despite the best efforts of medical voodoo. My greatest fear is exactly this, being sliced open like a ripe avocado. Jay and I spend the night in the hospital, me walking and walking, lapping the hallways studded with disturbingly generic oil paintings, wispy beachfronts, zombie-eyed children frolicking with puppies, hoping that exercise will get this party started. The nurses come by frequently to rub baby-inducing creams into my nether bits. In the hospital room, we watch reruns of The West Wing, or The Pretend President Show, as Jay and I like to call it. We find Martin Sheen comforting the pixelated anesthesia for our increasing dread of the Bush administration. Finally, in the early morning, one hour away from the deadline and the insertion of the IV drip, my water breaks. Labor blessedly begins. I feel lucky. Because from there on, everything goes relatively smoothly. I sit on the equivalent of a child's hippity hop, a giant rubber ball that allows the pelvis to hold itself in a more natural laboring position. I sit on my blue hippity hop and stare at the machine that tracks the progress of my contractions. There's a line on the screen that slowly trudges up the foothills of my pain. Up, up, up. The cramping pressure from inside myself rises as the line climbs. Can I stand it? It turns out I can. It's surprisingly bearable compared to what I hear some women have been through, those who labor for hour after excruciating hour, especially with first babies. I wouldn't call it picnic with champagne, but I'm starting to think I can do this. I surf the contractions, rising to the foamy tip of the pain's wave, then free fall down the other side. Later, this memory reminds me of my years as a competitive diver, springing off from the board, driving myself up to the dive's fulcrum point, the sweet spot you reach at the height of the body's trajectory. Then the most infinitesimal moment of pure weightlessness, no top or bottom, no velocity or gravity pulling in opposite directions, just you, motionless and free of your earthbound body, pinned like a butterfly and the beatific in between. As hours have gone, I've drifted into a mildly trippy state from the sleep deprivation. At one point, Jay's hand petting my back makes me think our cat Violet is there, rubbing against me softly. Another moment and I glance out the window to see a small bird staring at me. I think it's saying something to me, but I can't make out what. I point at the window. Look at the beautiful bird, I say to Jay. He looks over. What bird, he says. But now, in a single minute, everything has grown strange. No one will make eye contact with me. No one speaks to me directly. My mother is there. I see her at the end of the room looking drawn and afraid. Jay has gone utterly blank. What's happening, I say. The nurses continue fiddling with the machines. My doctor is reading some sort of printout. Finally, the doctor comes to me. She says, Aaron, the baby is in fetal distress. Every time you push, his heart rate drops. We think his umbilical cord is wrapped around his neck. We have to get him out right now. We're going to try a vacuum extraction. His name is Jude, I say, after Thomas Hardy, not the Beatles. But she's not listening. I'm free-floating, my lower half numbed by the blur of a last-minute epidural. 
I'm not feeling much of anything but a profound tiredness. I imagine a giant hoover being attached to my womb, and it turns out I'm not much off, though this hoover has a canister attachment with something like a tiny yarmulke stuck to the end. (laughs) I'm trying to be a good Girl Scout. I want to be a model citizen, but it's so hard to pay attention to what anyone's saying. The bird is at the window again, head cocked, watching me with one liquid eye. Push, Aaron. Push now. And then he's here. The first thing Jude does is shit on the floor. People laugh too hard in their relief. I laugh because they're laughing. They scurry him away to check his respiration, his reflexes. I catch a glimpse of him and think mildly, why is he so blue? Is that enough, you think? That's a terrible question to ask an audience. I apologize. (laughs) I hate it when read. Oh God, I just did it too. When readers do that, I always sit there going, "Just be quiet. Don't say anything." Okay. Well, just a little bit more. I'm actually sweating. Okay, where was I? Blue. Three months later, and I've decided to reread the novel for which we've named our son. He dozes on my lap, solemn as a troll, even on those rare occasions that he sleeps, finally worn out from nursing. It's a struggle for him, and he needs to eat constantly, never able to take in much at once. The lactation specialist can't tell us why his tongue thrusts forward. His lips don't seal properly. It just happens sometimes. This, it turns out, is the answer to a lot of questions you'd think to ask about babies. I was 33 years old when I found out I was pregnant. I had spent 32 of those years in a state of pleasant self-absorption, blood hounding down the path of my career as a writer of poetry, enjoying the sort of epically failed romances, unplanned travel, and ill-advised spending that one can enjoy, sans child. I hadn't known that I wanted to be a mother, and by hadn't known, I meant I wasn't trying to get pregnant. But Jay showed up at a party one night looking like a young Meriwether Lewis, And two years later, there I was, staring at a pee stick, realizing the full impact of what they mean in the instructions when they say the pill is 99.9% effective. (laughs) Unlike my closest friends, I never had that white-hot biological certainty that I would be a mother, mother, that I must be a mother. I was fine with kids in the theoretical, more power to them, but I didn't have much patience with their attention-hoggy ways. Add in their parents' conversational obsession with consistencies of poo, and I remained unconvinced. But that day, sitting on the toilet lid and staring at the blue plus sign, wondering what I was going to say to Jay, something shifted. I thought about that little BB-sized soul that had managed against impressive odds and contraceptives to lodge itself inside of me. I thought about the tenacity of such a spirit and how much I loved this potential person's father. In my mind, I see a great hallway with doors running along each side. I consider the people I know who've actually planned to have a baby, the idea of simply deciding one day, like sprinters bouncing up and down at the starting line. Runners, take your mark. Bang! Left to my own sense of timing, I could imagine myself at 50 saying to someone, well, maybe we could think about trying. (laughs) I'm 33 years old, with something that passes for a real teaching job, and even more miraculously, a good, steady man that I love. If not now, when? I just want to read one small part, and then I'll be done. I just want you to get to the end of this section. No, that's too much. I'll tell you about it more later. But thank you very much for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. Do you all like to do Q and A's, or are they just awkward? No, this is your evening. Well, I mean, I have another request if you want. Oh, sure. Was, what would you like to hear? Uh, the real life of lovers. Oh, that's an interesting choice. Yeah, that poem has never gotten the love it deserves. I have to admit, I can't remember where it is. Thank you. I knew that. <laughs> Wait a minute. 73. There we go. All right, I'll finish with this. The Real Lives of Lovers. Aren't you tired of the famous ones, immortal in their ivy-covered graves? Where's that infernal breeze or black plutonic love embedded in a pomegranate seed, 
to plant your seasons in a row and spin a captivating history. How far away the past lives from the present. Today, you need a ball of string to lead you back to passion. Be like Wordsworth, then, who claimed to find some recompense inside his second fling with nature. But who believes him? The middle-aged romantics PhD who taught this poem to you and countless rooms of other glazed 18-year-olds. Did he shake his head a little, sigh? Who knew the torches he still carried? Impenetrably beige with thinning hair, though Lamia could light him like a grill, imagine what he once thought he would die without. And you, now standing from your desk to stretch, shuffling to the back porch for the evening's final cigarette, the Pleiades above those princesses embarrassing the lesser stars. What little bargains have you failed to keep? He must have been about the age you are. Thank you for having me here. Thank you.